Hello, good morning, everyone. I think let's go ahead and get started. Uh, one quick announcement at noon, at 12 p.m., we will have a phone interview with Miss America in the plenary session. I know that uh, she could not join us because of bad weather, but hopefully we'll get to see her and uh, hear her voice. So thank you. Uh, now, welcome to the breakout session, Next Generation Entrepreneurs Reaching Newer Heights. It's my honor to introduce moderator of this session, Brad Burke. Brad Burke is the managing director of the Rice Alliance. Most recently, he founded and managed the local office of Wyant Corporation, a premier internet consulting firm, delivering internet strategy, creative design, and web technology implementation. Wyant went public through an IPO in 1999. Prior to Wyant, Brad was a principal with CSC Index, the management consulting division of Computer Sciences Corporation. Before consulting, Brad held management positions with Exxon Corporation. He received his MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg Graduate School of Management and his BS from Vanderbilt University. With that, I'll turn it over to Brad. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. So, uh... We're very pleased to, to be here this morning to talk about the next generation entrepreneurship and um, where it's headed, what the opportunities are, what some of the challenges are. And at the end of this, as we get toward the end, we will uh, give you guys a chance to uh, ask some questions. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to moderate uh, a group of what I would call uh, four uh, next generation entrepreneurs. So uh, I'm very proud to be able to moderate this. You know. Uh, from my perspective, um, my key role now, my key job is to direct the Entrepreneurship Center at Rice University here in Houston, and I know many of you from, from that work. But the job of the Rice Alliance is to help foster an entrepreneurial ecosystem and help to assist the next generation of entrepreneurs when we can. So this is right in the uh, heart of what we are about at Rice University both trying to create them out of uh, the wall, inside the walls of rice and outside the walls of rice in Houston. But um, why entrepreneurship? And I'll just lead off and then I'll let each of the, the panelists introduce themselves. But um, why that's important, and many of you know this or you probably wouldn't be here, but it, you know, just looking at the U.S. alone, uh, 80 to somewhere between 80 to 100 percent of all new jobs are created by entrepreneurs. And based on the Kauffman Foundation data, all new net jobs in the U.S. are created by companies five years or younger. So all job creation is really entrepreneurial firms. So it's important for us, it's important for the U.S. and global economy uh, to foster entrepreneurship. But it's also, I think, important for one other reason, which is uh, very different from prior generations. I think that for people to be successful today, they need to have entrepreneurial skills. They need to be persistent. They need to uh, be innovative. They need to be able to pivot. And uh, unlike uh, uh, earlier generation where individuals graduated from school and expected to be in a job for their entire life and retire with a pension, that doesn't exist anymore. And that expectation probably doesn't exist anymore, but I don't know, maybe I could add, you know, the, the folks on the panel will will address that better because they, uh, they have a longer time frame to look forward to. But uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, with that, let me introduce the, the uh, I'll let the four panelists introduce themselves. And let me ask them to talk about, uh, a little bit about first their journey of how they got to where they are as an entrepreneur or investor and secondly, talk about uh, what they're currently doing, we'll talk about their company. So first, uh, first uh, turn it over to Aziz Galani, and I'll just go down the, the panel. Hey guys, can you hear me fine? Okay, great. Um, so my name is Aziz Galani. Uh, I am currently a director at the Mercury Fund uh, here in Houston. 
Um, I came to the Mercury Fund after spending about 10 years uh, working with enterprise software. So I originally went to, you know, I, I grew up here in Houston. I went to UT Austin. And then after that, I went to work for uh, Ernst & Young, where um, I was working on uh, enterprise software deployments. Um, did that for a few years, uh, followed a partner um, that was leaving the firm um, to uh, start up a new business division for ABB. Um, so helped him do that for a few years, and I helped manage the uh, IT deployments within the division of ABB that we built together. Um, did a stint with Infosys, uh, where I was a senior engagement leader um, uh, here in their Houston office, so I helped uh, manage our accounts with BP and Southwestern Energy and a few other clients here in Houston. Um, and then I went to business school. Um, a weird thing happened when I went to business school, um, which is uh, I applied, um, I got in, and uh, when I got accepted, uh, I actually got a phone call from uh, one of the trustees of the school, um, and he called me and he said, hey, you've been accepted to the school, I run a venture capital fund, I see you work with enterprise software, you should probably work for me. Um, and so... Um, he ran uh, the Chicago uh, branch of the uh, DFJ Global Network, uh, which is Draper, Fisher, Jurvetson. It's a very long and storied venture capital fund. Um, they provided the original seed capital for companies like Hotmail, Skype, uh, Tesla, SpaceX, companies like that. Um, and so I went ahead and I joined up with him. So uh, while I was going to business school, I eventually talked my way into their Houston affiliate, which is the Mercury Fund. And I would go to school in Chicago during the week, and I'd fly back to Houston on the weekends. Um, I've been at Mercury Fund now for five years, uh, and uh, it's, it's a ton of fun. Um, so Mercury Fund is a venture capital fund. They're based here in Houston. Um, we actually invest across the gamut of uh, seed stage companies. So we have a partner that focuses on life sciences. We have another partner that's focused on material sciences. Uh, me and uh, two other partners, we focus on the IT side of the world. So I invest in enterprise software. We have someone who focuses on infrastructure. We have another person who looks at more consumer-y type stuff um, as well. We've got about $200 million under management. Um, we're on our third fund right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, lately I've been investing in companies like uh, Datical based in Austin, which does uh, schema management for databases in an enterprise setting, um, and uh, companies like that. So uh, happy to go into more details as the conversation goes on, but that's a little bit about me and uh, our fund. Thanks, Aziz. And, um, you know, it's worth probably noting that uh, your career path is probably probably unique. I don't know if there are <laughs> any other uh, MBAs that are able to get uh, positions with venture capital straight out of an MBA program. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it's weird. I sit on a lot of career panels um, and they say, hey, how do we get a job at a venture capital fund? And I really don't have a very good answer to that question, um, other than you should probably apply to Kellogg and get in, um, which is also where Brad went to school. So I guess, right. I guess that, that's the commonality, which is go to Kellogg and you'll get, someone will call you and give you a job. <laughs> you, apparently you're a great recruiter for Kellogg. <laughs> All right, uh, next is... Um, is Vipin, who um, was fortunate enough to be announced as the winner of the IIT business plan competition last night. <laughs> Rumor has it that you received a big check uh, for winning last night, but I haven't seen what it looks like or how many zeros are on the check. But uh, please say a word about, uh, about you know, yourself, how you got here, and, sure. and your company. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Vipin Thiagi. I'm the co-founder of Wardian Chemicals. We recycle lead acid batteries. Uh, my journey to... A little closer to the mic. Okay. Closer. So, it, it's okay now? Yeah. So my journey to being an entrepreneur, uh, I have a PhD in mechanical engineering. Uh, I quit that. I joined Wall Street for a while. Quit that and started doing... I, I just came back to engineering after that. Uh, we have been trying to work on this technology for the last couple of years. Uh, and... Uh, we have been able to perfect that right now. We're in the process of setting up a proof of concert plant back in India. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I was just starting. So that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, so uh, you have a career path that mirrors a lot of entrepreneurs in that uh, I think you said you had about three different jobs before you started your current company. Yes. So you're another one of these entrepreneurs can't hold a job. Uh, <laughs> looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> I say that, of course, facetiously, because I know that's not true. Uh, but um, how did you, uh, I don't want to let you off so easy, easy. Uh, how did you decide to 
quit the corporate world. What was it like to do that and, uh, and start? Why would you take the risk of starting your own company? Uh, and how did you make that decision? Sure. Uh, actually, the, the actual crash of 07, 08 uh, uh, helped me in that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I was, uh, I was actually, uh, uh, actually uh, I was very uh, fortunate to survive the crash itself on Wall Street. But uh, because of excessive regulations that were coming out, uh, my workday went from 12 hours to like five hours. So mm -hmm. I wasted an, uh, almost a year just doing that. Uh, I tried a stint in Singapore. I convinced my manager to send me to Singapore. I was doing three weeks Singapore, one week uh, Houston because my wife was still here. She was going to rise uh, for her MBA here. Uh, and it just got too difficult to just continue that and working five hours a day was just not my cup of tea. So I convinced my wife, which was a big decision, and uh, started to work on something more interesting, went back to my engineering roots, per se, and we are here. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, super. Um, Emma, uh, how about, uh, what's, what's your story? I have a bit of an odd story. I actually started my sort of career path uh, when I decided to go to undergrad at uh, Cooper Union in New York City for chemical engineering. I chose chemical engineering because somebody told me it was the hardest. Uh, I did that. I was a little bit tired after doing chemical engineering at Cooper Union for four years, so I decided I'd move to Germany and learn German. So I actually worked in a lab there for about a year doing high cell density cultivation. I was getting bored after that, so uh, somebody asked me to come and do a PhD in electrical and computer engineering at the University of Virginia in nanotechnology, specifically silver nanotechnology. And I had the opportunity to work with the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, uh, which was kind of at the time working on project on emerging nanotechnologies and talking with industry leaders, uh, people from academia, people from the government agencies on how to define nanotechnology, how it, the safety and sort of risk of those new technologies coming on the consumer market. And so I got involved with that. It led me later in my PhD to doing actually more lab-based work. And as you can imagine, I got bored <laughs> doing the actual lab work. So when I was finishing my PhD, I actually took up things like beekeeping and uh, started a company <laughs> in uh, medical software. Uh, my co-founder actually had just been hired into the medical school at University of Virginia, and he was actually a chemical engineer as well, and he saw a problem, which was they were trying to do this research on predictive algorithms for disease, but they had no tools to collect the data, they had no way to manage that data, and then they had no way to deploy any of the solutions that they could develop. So he actually implemented a grid computing system and started to develop tools to rapidly prototype these algorithms. And what I saw was that suddenly it started to get traction. More and more doctors started to come and look at the system. We started getting calls from different universities around the country saying, you have access to this data? What? <laughs> and uh, I actually had met some angel investors and some Darden professors at that time. And they said, well, why don't you start a business? Why don't you enter uh, the Darden business plan competition? And I said, well, I, I can do that. You know, I'm tired pi of pipetting things. So I went, wrote a business plan, entered the competition. We did well, won the engineering round, and I, my world was sort of changed 180 degrees. I was introduced into the world of business, which was totally counterintuitive to where I had come from as an engineer. And I loved it. It was fantastic, and I sort of got the entrepreneurial bug. And I, I never had really thought of entrepreneurship as an option. But just meeting the people in the field, people trying to bring this revolutionary technology out into the real world so it can be used and the impact can be felt, I, I said, let's go for it. And while I was finishing up my PhD, starting the company, talking to some venture capitalists, talking to some angel investors, I said, okay, I need an MBA. Not because I can't learn that stuff other places, but because I wanted to get sort of credibility in the business and healthcare space. So we had an opportunity to come to Houston, install our pilot at Texas Children's Hospital. And Rice University is right next door. So I actually came and did my uh, MBA at Rice and a concentration in healthcare. And began to network within the healthcare industry, uh, build my management team, and eventually raise funding for my company. 
So here I am running my company full time now. I have a bunch of employees. And what we do is essentially take that data coming off bedside monitors that's currently being lost most in most hospitals and then turn it into actionable information in the form of applications for doctors and nurses. So. What do you think? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anybody who would pick chemical engineering simply because not only it is tough, but because it's the toughest discipline uh, is pretty impressive. What, what do you hope to be able to what outcomes do you hope to achieve through looking at this data and uh, the data that in the past was thrown away? Why are, why are you doing this? What impact is it going to have? I would say that at the heart of what I, I try to instill in my employees and what we try to do is empower medical professionals. I mean, we, we talk to these people every day. We go into hospitals. Uh, I think they're, they want the technology that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis. They want applications that provide them the information they need in real time. And it's, it's just 20 years behind in healthcare, and they're struggling. And I have a lot of empathy for that. And so it's about empowerment, I would say. Yeah. Why, why do they want the data? Why do they want it? Yeah, that's a leading question. Why do they want? The, why do they care about the data? Well, we kind of make a uh, joke when we go into uh, healthcare, and and that if you look at monitors or bedside monitors that you know have the EKGs and respiration rates, uh, you know you can go back to the 1900, like early 1900s, 1920s, and they still have the EKG being traced out on paper. And doctors are looking at that same information, looking for the same patterns that they did, you know, 50 years ago. And the monitors have the, the technology that has changed is that it's gone from a paper tracing to a you know like TV monitor to an LCD screen, and they're not there's not been a lot of innovation in the space of taking that information, getting the things that are hidden out of it, things that doctors have an intuitive sense that are there, and then giving it to them and saving lives and saving lives yes bit by bit bit by bit. <laughs> uh, uh, Last but not least, of course, uh, Gorov uh, with Chai One. Gorov has been one of the most impactful individuals in the Houston community by doing more than simply his own company. But uh, Gorov, how about share a little bit about your your journey, how you got here, and you're involved in a couple different things in the in the Houston world, both in your own own company. Sure, thanks, Brad. Um, so my name is Gorov Kandelwal. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Chai One. Yeah, you heard that right, Chai like Chai Tea. Uh, Chai One is a mobile solutions company. We uh, build mobile apps for enterprises where we try to transform um, the enterprise's core businesses at scale, leveraging mobility. Um, I started Chai One in 2008, uh, basically 30 days before the market crashed, <laughs> but 30 days after the App Store launched. And so, um, you know, the, the launch of the App Store was kind of like one of those events where you found uh, oil or invented electricity, I uh, felt like a whole new market was going to be created and it was going to be massive when these smartphones got in the hands of most people in the world. So um, I spent the last uh, seven years before I started Chai One after college working for a uh, business transformation consulting company called Hewitt uh, for, their HR, for the HR group. So I spent a lot of time uh, traveling around the world working with the companies you know, like Boeing's and Johnson and & Johnson's and whatnot, trying to transform their bis core business processes, uh, dealing with change management, people, and realizing that after seven years, nothing had changed. You know, the, the executives uh, made a lot of decisions, but en ended up making no decisions. Um, but what I saw was that the core problem uh, with these organizations uh, was around how they communicated the change to the employees and how resistant those people were uh, to change, especially around software. Um, going before that, uh, I came here to the US uh, after high school in India, uh, went to a small town up in northern Indiana for college, um, worked uh, side by side with the Amish folks, very hardworking people. Uh, gives you a whole new perspective of what this country is once you go to the heartland. Um, ran a, several different companies in college, uh, catering companies, sold kitchen knives, delivered pizzas, ran, ran a software business. Learned a lot about entrepreneurship uh, just by doing things. Um, right now, Chai One is, is about five years old. Uh, we have about 51 employees here in Houston. Um, we are prim primarily in the oil and gas business. Uh, we also have some healthcare, some uh, finance, some other technology companies. One of the challenges that we have as a company is to find 
talent, developers, designers, folks like that. And um, I've always believed that if you can invest in the community, invest in the people themselves, uh, you will uh, build a better brand than shouting from rooftops and buying billboards and banners and things like that. So we started hosting uh, these developer meetups at our offices. And keep in mind, we bootstrapped this business. So we used to have a really small office, maybe 200, 300 square feet, and we would meet in the, in the lobby. Uh, but most of these developer meetup groups just wanted a free space to meet. They didn't want to go to a coffee shop and have to buy something or go to a restaurant and have to pay something. And uh, as we grew, we kept in mind that we needed to have a larger lobby area or some big conference room area to host these meetups. Well, a couple of years ago, it, it got big enough where we just couldn't hold these people. So um, I decided that this is going to be a core uh, focus area for Chai Wan to host every single developer meetup group in Houston. So everything from iOS, Android, Java, .NET, uh, big data, uh, you name it. We wanted to be there. We wanted to be in front of them uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it was a great recruiting tool. Uh, we have never used recruiters ever in our, in our company. Uh, we have a large mailing list of these developers, and we need people. We just reach out to them. Um, and uh, second, a lot of these developers worked for big corporations. And so what better way to get business than to have a developer go up to his manager and say, I want to work with I one because I like this guy that runs these meetups. Uh, great, great thing for, for sales. So we started a new business called uh, Start. We bought a warehouse in uh, East Downtown a couple of years ago, uh, primarily with the goal to be able to host these meetups. Um, so this is about 5,000 square feet of space. Uh, we were lucky to find a, a facility that was set up to be like a San Francisco loft or a New York sexy you know, type of space. Some guy had bought this warehouse and turned that into his bachelor pad. And so you can imagine, you know, glass everywhere, rock gardens, I mean, just beautiful place. And so um, we opened it up as a co-working space so people can, you know, rent desks. Like, just like you go to a gym and you have a gym membership and you pay a certain amount of money every month, whether you use it or not. Uh, similarly, this is a co-working space. People rent desks. Uh, they rent offices. Uh, not everybody there at the same time, which is great. Uh, so we can sell more memberships. But at night, it's a free space for these meetups to get together. And, um, and we're lucky to have a large amount of Houston's tech talent uh, come through START, which allows us to uh, not only fuel uh, Chai Wan, but also gives us opportunities to potentially invest in some of these potential startups that come out of these, uh, come out of these folks that, that come, to ch come to START. Um, so I'll end with this. One of the key problems with Houston has been around density of tech talent in one place. And so we're trying to solve that problem by, by having START be that place where people can all get together. Because I really believe that when smart people get together, like at IIT, magic happens. Thanks. That's great, uh, Aziz. You know, you just shared something that I hadn't known, which is, uh, yes. <laughs> sure that I hadn't known that, uh, that sort of a, uh, a part of your secret sauce of recruiting was the reason, one of the reasons you're doing these gatherings, these get-togethers, these meetups, is not just for the meetup purpose, but it's also an interesting recruiting uh, recruiting strategy, which is which is a neat neat lesson. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, started, if I heard it right, you started your company 30 days after the App Store opened, and that was 30 days before the crash. What's it like to start an IT company 30 days before the crash? I think it's great. I think you always buy when there's blood in the streets. <laughs> right, because uh, you get stuff for cheaper. talent was cheaper. Yeah, talent yeah. was talent was panicking. Talent was cheaper. Everybody was uh, laying off people. I had no money, uh, and so everything kind of like worked out. That's funny. Uh, that uh, Kaufman uh, data says that I think 50% of the Fortune 500 companies in the U.S. were founded during recession. So that's a uh, you're a small, I guess, an example of that. And one day maybe you, you you'll join that list. Um, one of the things that we were asked to talk about on the panel was what the changing face of the current generation of entrepreneurs. And uh, I think we've just seen or heard from four of the next generation entrepreneurs. But I'd be uh, curious to the panel, uh, curious on your perspectives. How has, the, how has the face of the entrepreneur changed in your perspective? What's different uh, than it was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and I know you guys weren't all around 40 or 50 years ago, but uh, how has that changed over the, the time frame? And I'll throw out a, you know, a, a part B to that question, which is, 
you know, the vision of the entrepreneur, or the ideal entrepreneur today, or the vision of an ideal deal uh, path is, uh, I want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. I'm going to drop out of college, drop out of Harvard, start a company, uh, go public within a couple years, become a billionaire. Uh, is that the model? What is the face of the next generation of entrepreneurs? And is that the model that we all should aspire to be? I can take that one. So I, I can't compare it to like 30 years ago, but uh, I will say that ever since I graduated from uh, college, I've watched my peers struggle to find employment. Uh, we've never had sort of that job security, you know, sort of idea in our head. So a lot of us have actually decided to go make our own fate. And I think uh, Brad's correct. There is a cultural reference out there at this point where we're looking to sort of these uh, cowboys, these heroes that have built things from nothing with uh, maybe the right uh, secret sauce to make something happen. But I, I also think um, uh, there's an aspect of technology to that too. I mean, it's, it's now that you have programmers. Anybody can really program. Anybody can gain access to technology. It's not limited to a few. And so you're essentially crowdsourcing ideas. And uh, anybody can really, with, if they're smart and then they have the gumption to go do something, they can make something. And I, not everybody's made to be an entrepreneur, but um, it, the potential is there uh, for a lot more people than I think it was before. Interesting. Yeah. I think I think the core business values hasn't changed and never will. You know, some something simple as profit, right? It's never going to be replaced by. It doesn't matter if you're in 20, 2300. Um, I think what's different is that you can fail faster. Uh, you can take more risks because technology is cheap. You can start a company for next to nothing, uh, almost free. Um, but but you have the chance to keep trying new things. Uh, until you succeed. And, you know, very few people hit it big the very first time. Uh, I'm sure Zuckerberg and some of the other guys, you know, uh, are, are the outliers, uh, but most people do not hit that big, you know, the very first time. So the key is to keep trying. Uh, it's just cheaper to fail these days. Hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, on that, I'd like to add a little bit on the, uh, uh, if I'd like to add a little bit on the perspective of India. I think the social uh, stigma of being an entrepreneur and uh, and being able to fail is be, uh, is actually being changing in India for the last 10 years or so. When I was growing up and I was going to college, my only thing my dad said, you know what, you need to just you need to uh, study hard and go to IIT and nothing else. I think uh, in the last 10 years or so, things have changed on that side. Even the kids getting out of uh, IITs, for example, are now ready to take a change uh, and start up companies out of school. Uh, which was not happening at least in, uh, 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 about 10, 15 years ago. I recently heard that a few guys from IIT Bombay have declined offers from Facebook and Google and have instead joined a couple of startups based out of Delhi. So that's a big change which has been coming out. Uh, other than that, I think as, uh, as was mentioned by Gaurav, the, the actual business values never change. It's still about the profit. But I think at least in India, a little bit more about the social aspect of business has been changing. Uh, um, we saw yesterday at the Business Bank competition that three teams from India, where they were working on the water solutions, um, which was actually pretty impressive. Um, they, they had very little, uh, very little amount of money, and the amount of money they were trying to raise was actually pretty minimal as compared to what we tried to raise here in the US. But they are trying to do really uh, good stuff which can solve real problems. So that's my perspective. Great. Uh, Aziz, you have anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, so I think that there are two types of entrepreneurs that I run into. Um, the first type of person um, is just your average, not average, but you know, your extremely gifted person who will be successful no matter what. Um, and when the economy is doing well, they get offered a giant pile of money to work inside of a large corporation, and they take that opportunity because it's a giant pile of money, and who'd say no to that? Um, when the economy is doing poorly, you know. Though that giant pile of money isn't available. People aren't hiring and offering these giant six-figure salaries to folks during bad economies. And so what they do during that time is they go ahead and they start their own companies. They may or may not do well, um, and, and they proceed forward. That's why when the economy is doing super well, entrepreneurship seems to be down. When the economy is doing poorly, everyone's an entrepreneur. Um, 
And those smart people, they're smart people, they'll figure it out and they'll do well. Um, there's another brand of entrepreneur um, who are just people who are just obsessed with the problem. Um, and it infuriates them that there's no solution to that problem. And they are just only focused on that and nothing else. Um, when I look at the entrepreneurs that we've backed over at Mercury Fund, I see a lot of those types of people. Like, uh, so some of you may know here in Houston, uh, Misha Govstein. Um, he went to U of H and while a student at U of H became obsessed with security threats. And he started Alert Logic in his apartment while going to U of H. Um, he made no money for his first few years. Um, he recently just sold a large stake in Alert Logic for an absurd amount of money and now he has more money than he knows what to do with. Um, but, 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 but during that entire time, he was just only focused on that security problem. And it, it's a testament to him that, you know, he has now since been extremely successful. His lifestyle hasn't changed. He hasn't bought a new house. I think he bought his wife a new car and that's about it. Um, but he's still <laughs> up till midnight every night looking at security threats because that's what he's obsessed with. And it's those types of folks that I think don't change, but now in this new world we live in, they have many more opportunities to take advantage of what Gorov is talking about, which is they can fail fast. They can try an idea, see if it works, and if it works, they're successful, and if it doesn't, no big deal, they just try again. And they have lots and lots of tools available to uh, open to them to try. So if you're obsessed with consumer hardware, that's what Kickstarter's for. You can make like a few hundred thousand dollars, get your prototypes out, and you know, see if it works. And if it doesn't, no big deal, you try something else. Um, if you're doing enterprise software, use AngelList to try to raise your money. Um, there are lots and lots of these avenues. They make your life a lot better, um, and it just feeds into this obsession that these folks have. And it, I think that's really interesting today. Interesting. Um, so it really has changed. So, I, you know, I heard you say uh, people are struggling to find jobs. They don't expect to be able to keep a job for a long time. There's no job security. Uh, there are these heroes, these cowboys out there that people aspire to now. Technology is more open. It's cheaper to get access to. There's been a democratizing of technology. People can uh, take risk, less money, fail faster. And, uh, and there's not the social stigma that there once was that, gosh, if you fail at something, you know, you are marked forever. In fact, that's a positive uh, thing today in terms of many entrepreneurs. I've heard VCs say they won't back an entrepreneur in their first startup. They'd rather back, in fact, they'd rather back an entrepreneur who failed in their first startup, who's working on number two, than somebody who was successful in their first startup because they didn't learn as much. And so I think it all feeds into itself. Uh, it's interesting, your, the comment about Facebook and Google, that uh, some entrepreneurs, I think those who fall in that latter category, as you said, uh, actually view Google and Facebook as big bureaucratic corporations now and would rather go work for a real startup than a Facebook or Google. And that's an interesting sort of trend uh, that we've seen. But let me, let me touch on one, or one last question to the panel about sort of the changing face of entrepreneurs and related to a trend we see in the U.S., uh, you know, a generation of millennials. And I almost think that's, uh, millennial sometimes has a disparaging uh, connotation to it, perhaps. The millennial generation in the U.S. is a generation who always got a trophy for every game they ever played in, whether they won or lost, assuming they even kept score, which a lot of times they don't. Uh, it's a generation that has it, hasn't had, it e had the easiest of any generation in some ways, whose parents are always there as helicopter parents ready to hover and jump in whenever their child has a problem. So that's the current generation. If you take that as the assumption, that's the current generation of people that are uh, come, going, to, going to college or graduating in the U.S. That flies in the face of the traits of the entrepreneurs need to be successful, which several of you described. Persistence, willing to fail, willing to be obsessed behind whatever they're doing to make it succeed. How does that jive? How do you reconcile the perception of millennials, at least in the US, versus this also perception that all these people are becoming entrepreneurial? And who's willing to take that? I'll, I'll who's take willing it. to take that on? I'll take it. Um, you know, I think millennials you know, because they've grown up in this environment, they grew up with their parents uh, struggling, uh, they, their parents had gone through a lot of struggles and they were told they were to change the world. So I, I get the feeling from them that they don't want to settle or compromise for something that doesn't work for them. And so they're always pushing sort of the, the boundaries 
of what other people might accept. I think the danger, though, is when we talked about the concept of sort of the hero myth of the entrepreneur in our society, I think uh, they, they, all of them have not learned yet that teamwork is an important aspect of making a successful business and that it is not just the star at the top or the figurehead that makes something happen. It is hard work. And I think ultimately it's those people who stick to it and realize that the power is not just with themselves but with their team and that they have to change the world, they have to work with others and in a society of others. I think that's, that's going to be critical. Mm -hmm. So, Right. You know, if you read the history of Rome, you, you read this, the, the early descriptions of Julius Caesar are pretty funny. Um, they s complain that he cut his hair too short and he wore his toga way too low. Um, and I feel like this is something that's been happening since we've been writing, which is the older generation always complains that the younger generation dresses poorly <laughs> and is way too lazy um, and will never accomplish anything. Um, you know, my, my dad was born during partition um, and he didn't have running water until he was like 18. Um, and so he used to make fun of me a lot because he's like, oh, you've got hot water all the time whenever you want it. <laughs> You're never going to amount to much. I mean, <laughs> until you use your own well, you know, you, you don't know what you're doing. Um, and it's funny because like, so I have a daughter now and she's six and, you know, she doesn't know how to use a keyboard, right? You know, her whole life, everything's been a touch screen. So she only, like, <laughs> so, so she walks up to the TV in our living room and she tries to drag the channel. <laughs> because because that, that to her is touch. <laughs> and so, you know, when I talk to my CEOs and they're like, I don't know how to motivate these millennials. I mean, this is the same argument we've always had t since the beginning of time. The reality is that every generation is more affluent than the generation before it. And so they are shocked and confused when that generation takes for granted the stuff that they have had their entire lives. So look, at the majority of my companies, we give free lunch to our employees. Um, that is shocking to my dad. He's like, what, you give free food to people? Like, <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, you know, you look at it from the other point of view as well, they don't leave the office during lunch, and so they put in more hours during the day. Um, and if I give them free dinner, they'll stay for longer than eight hours. They're now staying for <laughs> um, I, I think the trick with millennials is if you, if you take away the frictions around them doing an amazing job for you, if you can tie the, the, the work you want them to do with their larger goals for what they want to accomplish, they're the best workers you'll ever find. You just have to tie the incentives to what your goals are. And I think if you can do that, I think it works out pretty okay. I think one of the things that we're finding is uh, <laughs> most of our employees are millennials. And um, it's interesting because, uh, you know, Brad, you mentioned uh, in this country versus not in this country, right? So, so we, uh, a lot of our employees are from this country. They're born and brought up here. And uh, things that matter to them are craft beer, uh, <laughs> music, you know, flexible hours, uh, things like that. And so we have beer in the office, you know, and it bothers some people, but for most people it's awesome. Uh, we, uh, we have StarCraft and, uh, you know, Nintendo and Xbox competitions, you know, in the, in the evenings. And so most people, it's like shocking, like what? You know, I mean, how do people ever get any work done? But... And do you have any job openings? We have lots of job <laughs> openings, yes. Uh, and and uh, so what we're finding is that, that millennials are definitely very opinionated, uh, the smart ones. And... Uh, we, they, want, they don't want to go work for some big corporation where they become a number. Like they want to actually make a difference. And so, so we want to attract those kind of people, you know, people that have, a, have, have taste. And I think that's what we're finding different is they have a lot of taste. Um, something else that we're finding is that folks that come from abroad, so when we interview people from you know, South Korea or Turkey or Ukraine or India, you know, um, Seema, my wife, she runs HR for the company, and so she'll tell people as part of the normal pitch, you know, that, oh, you know, we have these benefits, we have flex time, we have beer Fridays, we have wine tastings, this and that. And the person from, this, this is recent, the person from South Korea was like, why do you do that? 
<laughs> Why would you do that? I mean, I'm supposed to come to work and work 10 hours and make a good salary and make my parents proud and go home and get a promotion. Why would you ever give beer to people in the office? You know, and it's, it's quite amazing how, you know, millennials outside the U.S. still have the same type of thinking, you know, that our parents did, which is go get a good job, you know, work all your life, put money into 401k, you know, and then you'll retire, you know, with a, with a good, uh, good package. But, but folks here have a very different opinion. You're saying we'll, we will corrupt the rest of the world soon enough? Is that... Uh... <laughs> well, I, I think that we're giving the rest of the world uh, taste. That's good. <laughs> Let me, uh, uh, let me change uh, uh, thoughts a bit about opportunities for entrepreneurs and the next generation of entrepreneurs. And so let me pose something I'm not sure, sure that, pose it in a way that I'm not sure I fully believe this, but you look at the internet. The internet now is, uh, depending upon how you date it, um, the internet was, you know, and people started using it around the mid-90s, I guess. And uh, it might be considered mature in its life cycle. So we had the original startups around the internet, um, Google and Amazon and Facebook. And uh, is, is technology now mature to the point where it's hard to find disruptive opportunities to create new startups and new companies? Are we beyond this? Uh, have now we, has, has everything been done uh, that's out to be done? You know why? Why should uh, are there opportunities for for technology te as for disruptive technology today, and where are they? Uh, I think this is uh, this is. I feel like we're living in the, one of the most exciting times, at least of my life. Uh, the possibilities for disruption are tremendous. There's so many, and they're all around us, and they're moving so fast. You know, five years ago, mobile had just happened, right? And so we're still a mobile solutions company. A lot of Enterprises are still adopting mobile, but half the crew at, at Chai One has written code for wearables, you know, so for the Pebble Watch, you know, and, and for the Fitbit, and, you know, now they can't wait for the Nest Thermostats API to come out, you know, next month, so you can control your temperature, you know, when you're driving home. Um, GE is making a lot of waves with their industrial internet, Mind Machines campaign. Uh, if you guys haven't seen that, you definitely should. You know, their, their basically mantra is, well, the Industrial Revolution happened in the 1800s, and then the internet happened in the, in, the, in the 90s. Well, the computers got connected. What about the machines? They don't talk to each other. They should. You know, so, the, so for example, for Boeing, the engines should know when something's about to fail. The facilities should know how to optimize themselves. The airports should know how to get the planes in and out on time. And then you have the smartphone, you know, which is the user the user now has access to so much information. Um, and then there's the Internet of Things, you know, with, uh, with everything in your house uh, uh, having a Wi-Fi chip or a Bluetooth chip in it that can tell you everything from when your washer's d done to when your coffee is ready. You know, the only thing it can't do right now is cook for you, and I would love that. That's what I need. <laughs> you know, I can get you a sous vide. Um, that will cook for you. <laughs> but um, look, Gaurav is completely right, and he's talking about a few of the newer technology trends that happen. But look, if we were having this conversation in 1975, we would talk about how IBM conquered the world and how no one has a chance. Um, if we'd have this conversation in 1985, we'd talk about how who this company Microsoft is taking over everything and you know and Apple is kind of at its peak right if, if we're having this conversation in 1990 we'd be talking about how Microsoft owned the world IBM was a has-been and about to go bankrupt and how Apple was basically like a buck a share um, and so I feel like every you know technology is this relentless thing that impacts our industry and every time there's a major innovation it just reshuffles the deck and resets everything. And every time there's one of these resets, there's a chance for a new company to emerge and take over the world. Um, and so wearables is this new disruption that's happening right now. The Internet of Things is this new disruption that's happening right now. You know, and, and they're both taking advantage of ubiquitous connectivity. I mean, there's almost nowhere on the planet you can go now and not be connected to the grid. Um, all this stuff is always going to be happening. There are lots and lots of open windows available to you right now. Um, one of my favorite apps is this app called Let's Pizza. I don't know if you guys have tried this or not, but basically it's you pick up your phone, you hit a button that says pizza on it, and it just 
based off your geolocation and your credit card information, it gets a pizza in front of you in 15 minutes. Um, if you're hungry, you should try it. Um, but, um, but, but there are always avenues open. There's always, there's always going to be a window. And, you know, you know I, I know you had to ask the question, Brad, and you didn't believe in it when you asked it. But, you know, it's... <laughs> it's it, no, it's but I'm going to order case. a pizza and see if it's here before the panel's over. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, I think uh, in terms of disruption, uh, if, you, if you just think in terms of um, other areas besides technology, I think uh, uh, if you think in terms of manufacturing, that's another area where you can have a lot of uh, disruptions, um, especially in emerging countries where the technology in terms of manufacturing technology is at least 20 years behind what you have in the U.S. Uh, so disruptions are entirely possible. We are an example of that. Uh, we recycle batteries, uh, but we have been able to disrupt a technology which has been there for almost 150 years. So disruptions are always uh, good, and I think they will keep on happening in every area. How about, uh, Emma, how about healthcare? Uh, well, I, I actually think there's, not just in healthcare, but all across the board, um, I think finding ways to make knowledge from data sets. I mean, there's a lot more data from the sensors, the wearable sensors, to enterprise systems that are networked and collecting data from multiple sources. You know, I would say that your average consumer, your average client, or whether it's a B2B play, they're all struggling with ways to leverage that data to build business intelligence, to build, uh, to reduce the barrier for either customers to perform a certain action, you know, get to a pizza <laughs> in 15 minutes. It's, it's making it easy for the customer or the client to do what they want to do. Um, and that you just can find opportunity for that in every industry, regardless. And if you're smart, you can figure out how the technologies fit together. You can figure out how to communicate to the different players and put it in something that, in a digestible format, in a way that people can understand. I think you have a recipe for success if you keep trying and you know learn quickly. Fail fast and do it again. Yeah. And so what I heard was that, uh, gosh, there's always customer problems and needs that are out there, including uh, Aziz's need for a pizza quick, quickly, and that uh, new technologies like mobile the industrial internet, the uh, uh, internet of things are all creating opportunities for entrepreneurs to take advantage of these leaps and jumps in technologies. And those are only examples today, but you'd say, and I think the panelists would say, well, we don't know what the next one is, but it's out there and it'll happen and it'll continue to provide an opportunity, a landscape, a platform for entrepreneurs to be successful uh, and to, to have big, uh, big impact going forward, yeah. big changes. What, uh, uh, let me shift to the third, you know, or a, a veer or two kind of challenges. Uh, what are the biggest uh, challenges uh, that, are on, that entrepreneurs are facing today, or how, and how maybe are they addressing those or it being faced? What challenges are out there for, for entrepreneurs? I would say for me, it's uh, finding good people. I mean, it's always a challenge to find uh, employees that fit with what you're trying to do, uh, are willing to go above and beyond to help change the world. I mean, uh, startup life and entrepreneurship is hard. You know, not everybody's, you know, some people want the nine to five job where they go and they make the boatloads of money. You know, and when you're looking at really intelligent, uh, capable people, they have a lot of options. So it's, it's about finding them and convincing them that what you're doing is really gonna change the world. Yeah. I think there's, uh, in my mind, there's two types of challenges for entrepreneurs. Uh, one of them, basically, the, the way you put them in the bucket is, as an entrepreneur, are you trying to build a company that's targeted to consumers or targeted, targeted to enterprise? The thing with consumers is that there are a lot of very strong players already in the field. So when you build a startup or a new company, you have to understand how these large organizations can pivot and or add a new service or add a new feature and put you out of business. Um, and it's also challenging to focus because there's so much cool stuff that's happening so fast. And so you could be in five different minds in terms of what you want to really focus on because something new hit the market or something new became funded on Kickstarter um, or is there something on Shark Tank and you're like, oh man, that'd be cool if I went in that direction. Um, so it's important to focus and important to understand, spend a lot of time in building um, a business case for, for what you want to really go to market with. 
On the other side is the enterprise, which is a totally different game. And in the enterprise, it's you're just up against a wall. You just have to keep chipping away at that wall, you know, uh, you know, stone by stone until you get in. Uh, the advantage being that once you are in, then hopefully you can you can stay in, uh, and uh, no one else is going to come in there and and you know take that spot. So as an entrepreneur, you have to pick you know which direction you have to go in, and the challenge is, uh, no matter which one you pick, you have to stay focused on that uh, to try to try to win on the enterprise side, and then be able to pivot quickly if you're on the consumer side uh, to stay relevant. Pippin, what? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think for me, uh, it's a team, it's a people. Uh, I mean, for us, it's, it's been a real challenge to get hold of really good people uh, who are willing to sacrifice the nine to five jobs, as Emma puts it. Uh, I think the business case can always be made, but the convincing of uh, the really smart people to come and join you without a, without a salary in some, in some, in, uh, in some times, uh, it's the biggest challenge for us. That's Aziz, what, uh, what are you, what's your perspective? Yeah, uh, so, so I invest in enterprise software companies, and you know, I think, I think the big challenge today is we have a generation of young entrepreneurs that have a vision in their mind of the way they think you know, you know, these enterprises should work. Um, and they're probably right. You know, th they grew up with this technology. They know how this technology works probably much better than the CIOs of Fortune 500 companies are. Uh, but uh, man, transition plans are, are, are something that I am constantly having to coach them through. You know, it, it, it's fine that you have this vision for how the company should operate with its 10,000 employees, but getting those 10,000 employees from their current state to the future state is just tough. Um, and so trying to help them through that migration path is probably the, the most common piece of advice I tend to give. Mm. So challenges uh, around finding people and especially finding people who will be willing to work for no salary is, a, is can be a difficulty. <laughs> um, the fact that if you're dealing in a consumer market, uh, your, your the competition may disrupt and take away that market. Uh, third, a challenge to stay focused or pick a focus and stick with it, and uh, and the difficulty of getting into an enterprise application because of the challenge and the transition required by that uh, by that enterprise. I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions, and I've got a couple questions here uh, in a second. But let me ask one last question to the panel, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Q and A. Uh, one last question is, uh, what's best about being an entrepreneur? What's best about doing what you're doing? I don't know, is it easier an investor full time? But what's best about being an entrepreneur? Why should I want to be you? Um, I think it's the happiness that you derive from building something from scratch. It's your baby. So, at least for me, it's that one. Well, I'm not getting, I've not gotten bored yet. So, uh, <laughs> I just keep uh, having to face new challenges and. I will say you, you can't plan for everything, so there's always surprises around every corner. I think for me it's an opportunity to build a legacy. I think uh, we all have to think about why are we doing this? What are we, why are we in this world for? What's our ultimate purpose in life? And, uh, and for me it's, it's to build a legacy of some sort, you know, in some shape or form. And so being an entrepreneur gives me a tremendous opportunity to do that. Oh, you, you, you wanted me to answer. Oh, oh yeah, I do want your answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, well this, is, this is the earliest I had to wake up this week. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I mean, like, I, I remember I lasted at Infosys for like 16 months. Um, and, and then I quit because I couldn't take it anymore. Because, um, and, and, and the reason why was because there were structural barriers that stopped me from doing what I thought was correct. Like, I, I distinctly remember there's this one time where I negotiated with a client to sell a piece of work for a certain amount of money. And when I went back uh, to try to generate an invoice through the system, um, they couldn't generate an invoice because they said that my, the bill rate I was charging the customer was too high. Um, and they refused to allow me to do it. And so I had to actually, in Word, try to recreate an invoice and send it to them um, to create that bill rate um, to do it. And it's, it's those barriers that used to drive me nuts. And w what I love about startups is that, um, you know, at startups, you know, everyone is completely on board to do what's right immediately with very little friction. And, 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 and once you 
take that drug, you can never go back. Everything else is just too frustrating for you. You're like, why, why, are, you, why are you standing between me taking money from that person? Why would you do that? Um, and, 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 so, and so it's very, very addictive. So, so uh, let's see, uh, what did I hear? Uh, you get to build something from scratch, you don't get bored, uh, to leave a legacy, and best of all, uh, you don't have to get up early in the morning. Is that, uh, <laughs> so I know it's easy to stop trying to call you at 8.30, I guess. Uh, I'll, I'll second that one. I'll second that one. <laughs> um, I, I will turn to some of the questions I've got on uh, paper. If you have other questions, please. I was going to do this uh, uh, live, but, uh, but this is good. I've got some questions, and please uh, write them down if you, you guys have more questions, and well, I'll turn to those. There were two questions about um, exit strategies, and uh, one was aimed at Aziz, the other is more broadly, but I'll let Aziz, I'll let you go first. The question is, uh, do you ask business owners that, you're, that come to talk to you for raise money, do you ask them for an exit strategy before you invest? And others, um, how do you plan your exit strategy before you start, before you even start a new venture? And underlying this question is, how crazy is it before I learned about venture capital that, you know, I've, my history is you start a company and you build it for keeps. But all of a sudden, the VC world sort of turned that upside down. And, you, you know, if you think that's what you want to do, VCs will, as easy, you probably won't even take a meeting if that's what somebody wants to do. But do you ask, I'll let you answer it. Do yeah. you ask businesses for an exit strategy? So, so I'll, I'll put some nuance on my answer. Um, so, and, and I'll, 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 do, I'll be very quick. Um, so, 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 the, so I'll go, go through three parts. The, f the first part is, look, you know, if, if you're talking about someone who wants to build a company and, keep, and, and build it for keeps forever, um, that runs into my first rule of entrepreneurship, which is if I'm going to sit down with you and I'm going to invest in your company, I want to know if your goal is to be rich or to be king. Um, and if your goal is to be king, I don't want to do business with you because I'm in this to be rich. Um, and I want you to be in this to be rich. And if there's a way for us to be rich, then we should become rich. Otherwise, we have a very large problem with each other. Um, the, the, the second thing is, at, at the beginning of today's panel, I talked about how we have $200 million under management. Um, those $200 million don't actually belong to me. Um, they've been entrusted to our fund um, to invest on behalf of literally widows and orphans. So we get our money from pension programs who are then giving money to the widows and orphans of firefighters and teachers. That's where my money comes from. And they've given us that money in 10-year increments. So I have to give that money back to them in 10 years. And so I need to have an exit plan. I need to figure out how to get the money back from you at some point because we have to feed those widows and orphans somehow. So we're very, very focused on what that exit opportunity looks like. And look, I'm not looking for a detailed, I'm going to sell this company to Microsoft or Google in 18 months type plan. Um, what I'm looking for is how can we in like three year, three to five years, build this company to a certain scale so that we have a lot of strategic alternatives in front of us, right? That's what I'm trying to work out. And look, if the answer is in five years we're making so much money that we can IPO, that's a great answer. If the answer is we're building this piece of the technology stack that Cisco desperately needs, that's a good answer too. Um, and we will achieve that answer together, but the point is there needs to be an answer so that I can believe that we can get to an exit opportunity so that I can give that money back to those widows and orphans because that's why I'm working. How about the others? Uh, the question was asked also of the group, uh, do you have an exit strategy? Well, I was, I was going to say that I think at the core of it, it's about understanding your different stakeholders. You have to understand both your customer and your potential investor because each of those different players have different motivations, they have different timelines. Uh, you have to be sensitive to that and being able to communicate how those different stakeholders think shows that you have a sophistication and an understanding of your industry and understanding of the different players in that industry and what's actually needed in that space. So when I talk about my exit strategy, I'm really looking at the healthcare industry. I'm looking at where do we fit in the network of things, who has come before us uh, and been successful, what did it take to get there, what are our clients and our and hospitals really need. So I would I would say it's about framing and communication. 
Let me, let me move on until we get as many questions as possible. And I, I love this one that I just got. Um, have you had, maybe I should say add ever, have you ever had to go from filet mignon to ramen noodles? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm vegetarian, so probably went from like veggie patties to ramen noodles. Uh, but uh, no, absolutely. I think I think that uh, every entrepreneur's journey involves, you know, being broke, and you kind of almost have to starve to truly, you know, appreciate, you know, where where you could potentially end up. Um, I love ramen noodles. You know, I think it involves less cooking. I, I would eat ramen noodles every day. But yeah, I think uh, I think the question really what it's by referring to is is uh, is uh, can you take the hard times? Uh, can you live with almost nothing, you know, while you're trying to build your dreams and, and go somewhere? Yeah, I think that's absolutely has happened and will happen, and I look forward to more ramen noodles tomorrow. I think maybe the, 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 the other corollary question would be, had you ever had filet mignon to begin with? And, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I mean, I mean, entrepreneurship is, by its very nature, an unstable existence. And... If you have structured your life in such a way where you have like $10,000 worth of burn a month, this is probably not the path for you. You know, you know, I've had, you know, really awkward conversations with the founders of our companies where they say, hey, my kids are going to this private school and I know that the company's running out of money, but if I'm going to cut my salary, then I'm going to have to pull my kids out of the school, so I need you, Mr. VC, to give us another $500,000 so I can keep my kids in this private school. That, <laughs> that's a structurally poor decision. Um, you, you, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, there are going to be very lean times, and you need to make sure that you're prepared for those lean times. And if you've structured your life where you can't say no to like a you know $120,000 a year then you you need to very seriously reevaluate your approach to entrepreneurship here's one i'm not sure uh, gorov why it was uh, directed at you but it was uh it says gorov what were your biggest failures and what did you learn from them i don't know why they think you have more failures than the rest of the panel <laughs> <laughs> but uh, more filet mignon <laughs> You other, the rest of the panel might be thinking about the answer as well, but uh, um, maybe you haven't had a failure yet. No, I have. And I think failures are very, very important because they teach you. You know, you need to learn something from them. I think my most spectacular failure uh, was my, my biggest um, um, business plan. I think, I think the only time I wrote a business plan, it failed. And uh, that was for a company called uh, Chai Hut. Uh, so for those of you wondering why there's chai in the name all the time, my, that's my family business. You know, we're a Marwari family, and my parents have been in the tea business forever. And uh, dad wanted me to join this company, and I said, no, I don't agree with your business model. Uh, so I started, uh, you know, computer companies. But Chai Hut was essentially, uh, think like Starbucks. You know, so basically you have a, a place that sells you tea, various kinds of tea, and uh, has a small co-working space next to it. Uh, so you can have your business meetings, you know, while you're drinking tea. And uh, I wrote a business plan for it. I took uh, a bunch of money out of my credit cards and uh, borrowed money from, uh, some, from some friends and went in and uh, did the trade shows and built a fancy website and built this whole branding campaign around it and went to market and um, probably spent, I think at that time, this is like straight out of school, so I probably spent maybe like $50,000 on this thing, which is more money than I ever had. And I made eight dollars. I sold one <laughs> bottle of tea. So, so that that was my biggest failure. But the benefit was that that website got so much traction from people that people started asking me to build websites for them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the the early uh, beginnings of Chai One. The truth comes out now as to how you actually why you started Chai One. I love it. Uh, anybody else have a failure that you would want to admit to? Sure. So uh, when I was in uh, undergrad, I bought the domain name Ruafsa.com, um, which, which you guys may or may not be familiar with. Um, and so I, I bought the domain name, and uh, you know I, I went ahead and I built an e-commerce site behind it to sell bottles of, of Ruafsa. 
I hadn't really thought through the strategy all that well. Um, I didn't have a proprietary source of Ruefsa, and I never shipped more than three things through UPS in my life. Um, but I went ahead and I built it, and uh, and uh, I was like, oh, okay. So you know, I, I was I think I was selling them for like seven bucks a bottle, and I was able to buy them for like three bucks a bottle. So I figured there was enough margin there. And, and then I quickly discovered that um, it cost six dollars to ship the bottles. Um, <laughs> And, and, and that was and just... You, we're going to make it up on volume. Yeah, yeah. The Santa Claus strategy, right? Through, through the um, Amazon drones. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and then when I would ship them, this is back when Rufsa used to come in glass bottles, not plastic. They would all shatter. Um, and then I'd have angry customers that were demanding their money back. Um, I learned a lot about e-commerce that summer. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it definitely informs a lot of my thinking on investing in e-commerce. All right, I, I won't, we won't continue to discuss failures. Let's see. <laughs> this is the funnest part. Yeah. That's true. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I don't want to cut Emma or Nippin off if you, uh, you want to share. You know, this is therapy. <laughs> <laughs> no cost therapy. The cheapest therapy you'll get. No, I'm good. You're good. I'm just good. Okay. All right. Uh, you know, uh, the one on a more serious, uh, more serious. How can you get more serious than failure? On a more serious note, or on a bigger picture, uh, there is high unemployment among recent graduates, uh, but not everyone can be an entrepreneur. I don't know if you buy that assumption or not, but that's the question. Not everyone can be an entrepreneur. But so, what advice do you have for recent? Uh, what advice do you have for recent graduates in today's uh, economy? I, I definitely agree with the sentiment that not everyone can be an entrepreneur. Um, being an entrepreneur is a crazy, insane lifestyle. Um, and, you know, the thing is, is I would argue that being an entrepreneur is much more difficult than working for a company. And so if you're trying to be an entrepreneur because you think that it's too hard to find a job, or if, if you think that it's just a lot of work working for a company, then, then please don't be an entrepreneur. This, this will be the worst decision you make in your life. Um, I, think, I think, you know, look, working for a company is really attractive. Um, you know, if, if your goal in life is to, you know, follow a process, follow a system, and be rewarded handsomely for following that process and that system, Getting a job is the best thing that could ever happen to you. Um, but, but, you know, it, like, like I was talking about earlier, look, if you're, if you're a smart person, you're graduating from IIT, life will figure itself out. You're smart enough, something will happen. Entrepreneurship is for that special brand of human that is obsessed with doing something in the right way in their eyes. And, and, and that's what entrepreneurship is for. And so if, if that's the case, then you go down that path. Um, I, I would really, really though say that if you can't find a job, start a business, really think about that statement really hard because it's really not the way to think about the world. Uh, I, I think of uh, jobs and, and employers kind of like dating. There's a, there's a guy for every girl and a girl for every guy. You just need to shop you.com. <laughs> Right? If, 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 if you're like Ashwarya Rai, you know, like, or you went to IIT, right? Then, then everybody wants you. Uh, but, but if you didn't, then man, there's lots of shadi.coms out there. So, uh, so I agree with Aziz uh, 100%. Not everybody can be an entrepreneur, nor should you, you know, force yourself to be an entrepreneur if you don't have that in you to want to truly change the world. Uh, but if you have even something that you're super passionate about, that you feel like you can give up everything, and be up at three in the morning working on it, absolutely go for it. Um, because when you don't have a job, you have tremendous amounts of time. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's what entrepreneurs have, is a lot of time. And so use that time effectively. I, I would say that, you know, to future entrepreneurs, you know, there's lots of opportunity out there. It's all around you. You have to sort of have the outlook that, you, you, that there is possibility, there is sort of this this wellspring of hope, and you know, finding the 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 thing that nobody else can see, and doing it in a better way than other people have done before. Um, 
But I would say, from a personal perspective, one of the uh, largest challenges of being sort of the leader and instigator of a particular company is that you have to be prepared to ride the roller coaster. And it is a roller coaster. It is literally, you have the highest highs and the lowest lows, and it might be on the same day, and you're the one that has to put on the face, you know, the strong face, and I guess protect your employees and protect your team from the shock of what might come around the corner next. And you know, you have to hold the space. And to do that, you have to be pretty well grounded and you have to see beyond the present. So. Bippin, anything to, uh, to add on that? So what advice would you give? And I know you brought it to, uh, uh, you, you can keep it to current recent graduates or just more broadly to entrepreneurs? Sure. Um, I think it's, it's very important to find something that you really, uh, really uh, uh, I mean, if you can find a passionate thing, then uh, it's easy to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I don't agree with the fact that you really require uh, plenty of money to become an entrepreneur. Uh, we bootstrapped about $25,000 to start a manufacturing company back in India. We uh, designed machines from scrap metals. So it's tough, but... Uh, if you're really passionate about it, you can do it. That's the only advice I can give you. All right, so we, we've got about uh, one minute left, according to my watch. So I'm going to play, uh, they don't know I'm going to do this. They're going to play the word association game. I'm going to give you a word, uh, one word for each person, and you need to say the first thing that comes to your mind, all right? All right, so I, I've got four different words here because otherwise it'd be cheating. All right, Aziz, venture capital. I hear we're evil. Evil. <laughs> you hear we're evil. <laughs> Funny I, that, I think that gets applause. <laughs> Are you evil? I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Vipin, uh, your word is entrepreneurship. Tough. Tough. Um, Emma, I'll give you three words. <laughs> Value of an MBA. It was a question I just got too, so I'm covering two birds with one stone. <laughs> I gave you too much time. You got to get first the word out of your mouth. What value of an MBA? Your Parties. Cheap. Parties. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to make an advertisement for a Rice MBA program. <laughs> for only eighty-five thousand, you can go to parties. <laughs> and last one, uh, Gorov. Your word is Houston. Gold mine. Gold mine. All right. How about a thanks, a thanks to all four panelists. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, all the speakers. What an awesome session. Can we have a one big round of applause for them? So on, on behalf of uh, the IT 2013 conference, please accept a small token of appreci appreciation.